<laughs> it is an absolute pleasure to have truly one of the nation's most foremost leading experts in federal Indian tribal policy and property rights. Without further ado, Elaine Wilman. Oh, well. Thank you, Bill. Um, I first want to thank Bill Brock and your Skagit County Republicans for inviting me here. I had the privilege of being with you folks at a Lincoln Reagan dinner a year or so ago, I think it was. And I've been here in the Seaver, Willie, and Williamson and Skagit County area two or three times. Very familiar faces and hard-working, well-informed folks. Some of them are here. A couple of guys named George and Tina. And, uh, I had previously met Ron Wieson, our new commissioner. And, um, I'm really proud of Skagit County. As a, you know, let me back up a little bit and tell you a little bit about where I come from. Um, I'm the kid of a traveling insurance man. We moved all over the Northwest. But I lived for several years in Spokane. And then later on, when I had kids of my own, I moved them back up to the Spokane Valley to have a rural lifestyle, get them the heck out of Southern California where I was at the time. And, um, I've lived on the Yakima Reservation for 16 years. Um, a lot of my life has been in Washington State. But I don't have a hometown. I don't really have a home state. But the closest thing to it for me is Washington State. And I have watched over the past 25 years this state just cave and surrender and hurt itself, but basically hurt its people its property owners, its businesses, its voters. This state appears to be operating in the best interests of government, both state government and tribal government, and not in the best interest of the people that live here. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but I also want to do a little cheap disclaimer and advertising. I'm speaking only for myself. I'm affiliated with many organizations, but I speak only for myself. And uh, I make very clear distinctions, and this is something some people have trouble understanding, but once you get it, it's easier to talk about it. And that is I make very clear distinctions between my right as an American citizen to weigh in on any government decision, whether it's a local, municipal, or county, or state, or federal. My right as an American citizen is to pay attention, follow, speak up, support or oppose government decisions. And that is very separate from my respect for culture, all cultures. And that includes tribal culture. So all of my research and all of my talks are oriented around government decisions. But when I speak about federal Indian policy, well, I'm immediately a racist, you know? <laughs> because the the tribal government and Indian gaming industry ties tight together government decisions and culture. If you oppose what the state or the federal government is letting us do, well, you're a racist. They lock up that decision making with culture. And it makes it very difficult for good hearted American people who want the best for tribal families. It makes it very difficult to say, hey, wait a minute. You're getting all this money, you're doing all this stuff, and your people are still living dismally across the country. So I talk about the government decisions, and when I and I encourage others to look at it from that perspective, because a tribal government is not doing anything in this country that federal and state government isn't sanctioning first. Our issues are with our federal and state government, not a tribal government, not even the Swinomish here. There's nothing that tribe is doing here that hasn't been fully endorsed, blessed, and facilitated by the state of Washington or the federal government. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, so I'll be talking about that, but I also want to just quickly do my cheap advertisement. I have a website, and I need to acknowledge Laura Lee O'Neill. She's my fellow road warrior. <laughs> we go everywhere together. And Laura Lee has created an awesome website we have cards here, it's called thiswestisourwest.com. And on this website is an icon for every state in the Western states. And Laura Lee, when, when people send her things, she posts them on the website. 
It's one of the best resources to stay in touch and keep informed with what's going on in Washington, in Idaho, in Montana. You know, so I really encourage you. We'll, we didn't want to pass these out early, they'll blow away, but we'll be passing this card out. This West is our West.com. And I didn't forget it this time, did I, Lorley? <laughs> I couldn't do a lot without her. And also, I do have two books. There's some of the few if, books out about the government decision making and federal Indian policy. One is the Going to Pieces book. Uh, some of, many of you already have it, but if you don't, it's here, and it's my Thelma and Louise road trip when uh, a videographer and I did a road trip from Washington State to New York across 17 Indian reservations, and we held the camera up to tribal families and members, to farmers, ranchers, teachers, sheriffs, and it was our experience going across the state on these reservations, and it's relived in this book. So the reader gets a kind of a fun and interesting story about these two crazy women that went across these reservations. But along the way, as you're reading, it's an accidental and good education on federal Indian policy. So we have that one, and then this book is more of a collection of recent work I've done. It's a good reference book for community leaders and elected officials, Slumbering Thunder. And by the way, Laura Lee, who's my magic person, designed the cover of this book. It's really pretty. So Slumbering Thunder is a collection of issues and things that are helpful to community leaders and elected officials. And Going to Pieces is a really good background on federal Indian policy. Now I have to get out my notes because I want to start with something. I want to talk about just a little background about what happened to our state, what happened to Washington State. The last Republican governor was John Spellman, who left office in 1985. From then on, you had Booth Gardner, Mike Lowry, uh, what's his name, Locke, Gary Locke, Christine Gregoire, the Indian princess. Uh, and, uh, and now, you've got boy Bimbo, Jay Inslee, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, some three years in a row in Washington State, I will call them smothering blankets. Three years in a row across Washington State properties, property owners, businesses, came three pieces. In 1988, Congress passed the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Well, Governor Lowry saw that one coming. <laughs> And in 1989, coincidentally, one year later, oh, look, a train. As I was saying, in 1988, this is a three-year period, 88, 89, and 1990, that slammed Washington State. 88 was the gaming that set the stage for tribal tax-exempt casinos. 89, Governor Lowry is honoring the 100th anniversary of Washington State, comes out with a centennial accord. And in that accord, he created a state trust relationship with Washington State tribes. Now the federal government has always had a trust relationship with the American Indians and tribes. State governments have no such thing unless a state self-imposes, or I call self-inflicts one, and that's what Lowry did with the Centennial Court in 89, because he smelled the gaming money coming. He absolutely smelled it coming, and set up a state uh, Indian agency or desk in every state agency, and all of a sudden, it's a marriage made in hell between the state of Washington and tribal governments. I mean, I'm just going to say that out loud, because it is. Um, and all of a sudden, they're the special governments that are expanding their tax-exempt businesses. Well, let's say the village is a lovely example, wiping out Marysville. Um, the tax-exempt economy of 31 tribes in this little state is just eroding incrementally the taxable economy of Washington State. The land grabs of tribal governments across the state, pulling them off the state tax base and into federal trust status, is eroding the property tax base. 
And who gets to pick up the gap? And, and the taxpayers, the property owners, the remaining business and taxpayers get to make up those losses and have to because the state just wants more like the tribal governments just want more. And so that was 88 and 89. 1990, Booth Gardner, as he's leaving office, just before Lowry came in, signs, and he signs it on April Fool's Day, 1990, the Growth Management Act. Now the Growth Management Act is sensible in some regards. Clearly, municipalities and urban areas, and uh, clearly, growth needs a certain level of management. You need cost efficiency to bring roads and infrastructure to your residential, to your business. I don't dispute the Growth Management Act for its intent and its utility from a common sense point of view. But the Growth Management Act has been co-opted badly over the years by such groups as two years after the growth management comes FutureWise. FutureWise sees the game. Hey, they have to manage growth. We'll force them to manage it our way. You know? 88, 89, 90, those three blankets layer across Washington State. And they just nail the businesses and the taxpayers. Just nail it. And so the partnership, that marriage between tribal governments and Washington State, has now taken on a second wife. <laughs> and I call that future wise and your environmental greenies who say the human population is irrelevant. We need habitat and natural resources for all of Washington State's critters. And we need the human population to just climb up in the little condos in the urban areas and live in the little boxes. And the rest of Washington State is going to be for the tribe and the critters. That's going on. And that's getting legislative approval and sanctions because these organizations like the tribe and the environmental wealthy, environmental well-funded groups, also affiliated with Agenda 21 and Soros and the fun people, they hold the money, they hold the purse strings, and they get the elected officials to dance. So let me look at my little notes here. Um, the, um, the bottom line is that this process happened 30 years ago. 30 years ago, 88, 89, and 90. And most of us were aware of it coming on, and most of us were, well, oh, okay. We're okay with it. You know, one thing happens, well, okay. Another thing happens, well, okay. And now you have this whole system that is rendering the vo voice of the voter, that is rendering the voice of the Washington property owner and business unnecessary, irrelevant. Irrelevant. This is a state that is looking to the best interests of the state and the tribal governments, not you. And this is a state that is the result of 25 years of Democrat socialism, um, liberalism, harm to the good people of Washington State. You need a red wave in the worst way here. You really do. And a lot of this is our fault. Because we backed up and said, well, okay. Oh, the casinos are coming, okay. Well, okay, the growth management, okay. Well, we know, we know we have to abide by certain things, you know. Uh, well, okay, the environmentalists have a point. And we have just kind of coasted along quietly without making those waves for 30 years. That's how far behind the curve the voters and property owners and businesses, and small businesses especially, that's how far behind the curve you are in my very favorite state. And it just breaks my heart. So the challenge that I want to make to you guys is I think it's doable. Uh, we just had the miracle in 2016 because a lot of what I'm talking about here has certainly impacted in the same manner many other western states and all the states. We had a miracle in November of 2016 where the quiet folks like you and me that were just paying attention got to the polls. 
and we changed the movement, the forward. We we put the brakes on what was a sh certain decline of the United States when we brought President Trump in. And you've seen that. You've seen that. And we did it. We did it because we didn't believe or follow CNN, MSNBC, and all those idiots um, that still put out the propaganda and the harm. We just quietly went to the polls. We just quietly mailed in our ballots. And that has to happen here. I was looking at a map last week of Washington State voter turnout. And there was an article that says King County should not control the, the, the elections in Washington State. That the only reason King County is controlling the King and the kind of county north of it, I think, have 70% voter turnout. Now, they only have 28% voter turnout in Yakima County. And in most of the rural counties, the average voter turnout is somewhere between 28 is low and 37 is high. But in your big urban counties, voter turnout is big. You know? So, if the rural voters would mail those ballots or get to the polls, there's a way of getting the red wave. There's a way of, of uh, having a Republican governor one day. There's a way for Mike Petrich to get into office, you know. But it's our job. It's our job to up the voter turnout in Skagit County. Yeah, I think Skagit County was 37% or something like that. It was not up there. It was better than some of the lower ones, but it could be better. It could be a lot better. And that's one of the things you can do. Um, I wanted to kind of combine some information on Indian policy with with what's happening in the state of Washington so that you kind of see the intermingling and the harm. Um, one of the biggest things that makes the tribal political influence so powerful. There's a couple. But one of the big ones started in 2000, 10 years after gaming, the gaming money. By 2000, the gaming uh, revenue was about 20 billion a year. Uh, now, 2018, it's up to over 32 billion a year. Uh, but in the year 2000, one little tribe in New York State went to the Federal Election Commission and said, can we participate financially in elections? And that was the uh, Oneida Tribe of New York that sent a formal request under legal, uh, you know, letterhead, saying we'd like to participate financially in America's elections. And the FEC, which is an appointed advisory body, unelected, the FEC said, swell idea. You can do that. Well, what's good for one tribe immediately flew across the country in 2000. This was just before the Bush-Gore election of 2000. And all of a sudden, gaming money and tribal financial contributions was pouring in to the Bush-Gore election and has been pouring in to every election since. That's why you have Jay Inslee. That's why we have Senator John Tester. You know, that's what's happening. Your municipal, county, and state governments may not cut a check to a political party or a candidate, but tribal governments can and do in large quantities, and they don't have to report it. Only the recipient has to report it, but if it comes in a little paper bag of cash, does he or she, you know? So the, the financial power of these tribes to control Olympia, Salem, Helena, your county commissioners, uh, your, your legislators at every level. The political and financial power of these tribal governments is enormous. And as a comparison, uh, the land base of Washington State could be fit into the state of Montana almost three times. You just put about three Washington states in Montana. Washington State has 31 tribes. Montana has only seven, but we're in significantly similar difficulties in Montana with just seven little tribes, and Washington State is being literally taken over by the 31 tribes, politically, legislatively, environmentally, jurisdiction, and what's happening is this 
governing by collectivism is replacing that republic form of government under our constitutions that were promised. And we're not fighting like hell to re restore it. We just have to. We just absolutely have to. Um, and by the way, I'm going to really encourage Q&A, because that's how we all learn. The, um, I wanted to mention an example of what's happening in Montana, because it's not likely to happen here, but it could, depending on your populations in various counties. In, uh, Montana did the same thing Lowry did. Montana imposed a state trust relationship with its tribes. And Governor Bullock in Montana brags about having 300 tribal members in his executive branch employee. And the money rolling out from the state of Montana, state tax dollars, is just obscene every year when they're already getting the federal subsidies for all the basic needs. Uh, so it's like double dipping. But these candidates in Montana know where the campaign contributions are, and that's what they're doing. In Montana, the, uh, in Bighorn County, Montana, in 2006, the year that Tester got into office, in Bighorn County, Montana, the Crow Tribe published a full-page ad in the Billings Gazette. It said, we are running this slate of candidates. We are taking over Bighorn County. And uh, they did that. Uh, all three county commissioners of Bighorn County are enrolled Crow tribal members. They did that. 90% of the county employees in Bighorn County are tribal members. Now they're serving two masters here. And, who, and they're making decisions that are not necessarily the best interests of the county or the non-tribal population in Bighorn County. They also, the Crow Tribe and the ACLU, sued the state and said, the polling places are just too far away from our Native Americans. We need more polling precincts. And the state lost. The Crow Tribe and the others in the state received additional polling precincts on their reservations. And they placed them on federal Indian trust land where the Secretary of State, whose sole job is to protect a fair and free election, the Secretary of State has no enforcement authority or oversight on federal, in, federal Indian trust lands. So that's where they put the Native American polling precincts. And on the Crow Tribe, they gave them a paid day off from work, they held feasts, they issued new tribal membership cards, an Indian name or an English name, said vote here, go over and vote there. And that's how Senator John Tester came into office in 2006. And that's how John Tester stayed in office in 2012. And that's likely what's going to happen in 2018, unless the forgotten people, the deplorables, get to the polls in Montana. We don't have a mail-in ballot like you guys, um, but that's happening. Likewise. Right up by Glacier National Park, a beautiful area, the Blackfeet Indian Reservation is there. And the uh, election in the Glacier County created three, all three county commissioners are enrolled members of the Blackfeet tribe. And there's only two towns in Glacier County. Uh, Browning was one. Browning was taken over. Uh, Financially, Browning went bankrupt. The state of Montana didn't lift a finger to help Browning. And Browning, the municipality, and all the assets were taken over and acquired by the Blackfeet tribe. So that leaves Cut Bank on the edge of the Blackfeet reservation. And you have three Blackfeet tribal commissioners failing to deliver services, jacking up the taxes, not paying the bills, putting Glacier County in absolute distress. So much so that there was a hearing recently in Helena and the chairman of the Glacier County Commission, the chairman of the county commission is being grilled about the financial mismanagement going on in the county. And he stood up in the hearing, the financial committee in Helena, and he ranted about 
the abuse the white man put on him as a child. He ranted about those racist county members, those racist uh, cut bank voters and property owners and businesses that are concerned about what he's doing as a county commissioner. He ranted on in the hearing for 15, 20 minutes. And the legislators at that hearing first let him and never required him to answer their questions. Just don't want to be called a racist. And so Glacier County, Montana, Bighorn County, Montana, are failing counties. Where I live on the Flathead Indian Reservation, we're struggling too. The tribe there, the Salish Kootenai, hugely politically powerful. The only advantage is that our population in Lake County is 75% non-Indian and 25% tribal. So as voters, we can hold on, keep the tribal members out of our local elected office, but it's still a big struggle. That's going on. You had, you've got Senator John McCoy, who's been in your Olympia, <laughs> running Olympia for years. And you're very likely to have more. And you have tribal members that across the country, the National Congress of American Indians and the Indian organizations are really pushing tribal members, get into elected office any way you can. We'll take them down from the inside. And that is a very big push. We have that going on throughout the Western states. So I wanted to mention that. And one thing that I don't think, um, one thing that I don't think is being publicized, I know the Indian industry is not publicizing it, but one good thing that's happening across the country is the United States Supreme Court. It has been reining in federal government overreaching. It has been reining in excessive tribal government authority. About three or four years ago, it came down with a ruling. I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the case. But the ruling said the tribal sovereign immunity no longer applies to individual tribal elected officials or employees or volunteers. Tribal sovereign immunity is no longer available to the individuals that are making those decisions. And if a tribal leader makes a decision that is detrimental to you or me, we, you can take them into court and they do not have sovereign immunity. They, don't, they do not. Now, nobody, no tribal entity is spreading that word. And a lot of counties and cities and, that might otherwise consider legal counsel and litigation they don't because they're afraid, oh, they have sovereign immunity, we can't sue them, it's just going to be a waste of money. It's no longer a waste of money. If you have an elected, a tribal elected leader who has, especially if they are receiving their paycheck from federal funds, which they are, they can be hauled into court if they are abusing or exceeding or, ne or negligent in their performance. So little towns and counties can do something about it now. But most of them don't know. That's why I want to mention this. And that was four, about four years ago. This last session, the Supreme Court also ruled that tribal corporations and businesses no longer have sovereign immunity. The only remaining sovereign immunity is the tribal government itself. That's it. The rest of it is gone. But you're not seeing that in the Seattle Times. You're not seeing it in your Bellingham paper. No tribal folks are talking about, oh God, the jig's up. Our corporations can be held accountable in a court now. Our businesses can be held accountable in a court now. This would include your casinos. Um, and our elected officials and employees can be held in a court. And all that's left of sovereign immunity is the tribal government itself. And that's a big shift and something we should be grateful to the U.S. Supreme Court for. So I want you guys to know that and consider that the next time somebody comes stomping in and says it's going to be this way 
I worked for the village of Hobart, Wisconsin. They, I loved it. They, they called me back there eight, in 2008 because the tribe there had, tribal leaders had walked into the municipality. It'd be like walking into the Burlington or Cedar Woolley City Council. And the tribal leaders and attorneys walked into that council and said, prepare to become extinct. We're taking down this municipality. And uh, they were really getting bullied, right? And that's right next to Green Bay. And a lot of, it's a beautiful suburb of Green Bay and a lot of Packer, go, go Packers. Uh, a lot of Packer coach and players live there. <laughs> and I think the tribe walked in and said, you're going to be gone. We're buying all the land back. We're taking it off the trust. You're gonna, we're coming after you. So they brought me out there. And the good news is I was there from 2008 to 2015 when I moved to Montana. And we fought them. We pushed back. And the first thing that happened was the Green Bay Press Gazette started bashing Hobart for hiring that anti-Indian woman to come back, you know, bashing me before my moving truck even left top of it in the opinion pages, bashing continuously these hard-working elected officials for not being able to get along with the poor United Indians. They just weren't getting along with the poor United Indians. So I get back there and do a little homework, a little research, and the, this Hobart's a 33 square mile municipality, full service, police, fire, public works, full service municipality. Its annual operating budget in 2008 was somewhere between four and five million. So then I find the annual operating budget of this, these poor old night Indians, 573 million. So when we started publicizing some of the facts and some of the law and, and standing our ground, even though we're being called names, stuff reversed in a hurry. The Oneida tribe never got a parcel off our property tax rolls from 2008 to today because we pushed back. We pushed back. And we built a new commercial center and residential center out there to upgrade and offset the you know, municipal revenue in case the tribe ever gets anywhere. But we, that little, that's one of the most courageous municipalities I've ever worked with. And they, you know, and so many others could do the same thing. But you have to be willing to move through the propaganda you're gonna get in the paper. You have to be willing to be called names. The law is always on your side. You have to be willing to spend the legal funds because the short-term legal funds are a lot less than the long-term forever loss of the property tax. Mm -hmm. You know, right here in Skagit County with that stupid Hearst decision, the long-term loss of the property tax for 5,700 parcels that can't have a well. I mean, that's huge future loss of property tax and revenue to your county. So spending even a million in legal fees to say, hell no, you don't treat this county, state of Washington, any differently than you treat the other counties. Spending even a million dollars to fight and, and, and insist that this county be treated the same as all counties is a good play because the multi-millions of lost homes, businesses, jobs, property tax in the future is, is dead. It's dead unless somebody gets his back in the courts. And that's my wish for Skagit County. That's a very serious wish. Um, that Hearst decision was dangerous. It also sets a precedent that what can be done, what can exclude one county because of the precious Swinomish, you know, can happen when the legislators maybe want to do it to another county out there. Well, we can exclude this county. It's not cooperating with us, so we'll just exclude them. And you're setting a terribly ugly precedent when the state does not treat its counties the same. You know, terribly ugly precedent. And yet there doesn't seem to be a lot of momentum for saying, hey, wait just a minute and challenging them. And I hope that the day will come when you do. The other um, issue is um, the, uh, oh, on the Hearst incident, I recently reread that ruling. And being a property rights patriot, 
and small business believer. I'm reading through the Hearst ruling, and it was issued in October of 2016, and I word searched it for the word constitution or property rights. The Hearst ruling from the Supreme, Washington State Supreme Court. The Constitution is not in there, in that ruling. Zero reference to the constitutional rights under the state or federal constitution in that marvelous ruling from your Washington State Supreme Court. So then I word search it for Swinomish. <laughs> 23 references in the ruling to the precious Swinomish from your final Washington State Supreme Court. And now you have the state of Washington and the counties wringing their hands and wishing it wasn't so. Well, that's what we've been doing here for 30 years, wringing our hands and wishing it wasn't so. So, and it's time to get informed and get noisy. Speak up, relatives, family, everywhere you can. Vote. This state has to become a state again. And the peril of that is manifested in your Washington State Culvert case. You know, that case should have been decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. Absolutely should have been. And Justice Thomas, in a ripping dissent, said, this is stupid. You should rule because we have the right to rule and we know the answer and we should rule. But Justice Gorsuch, of all people who wrote that ruling, ruled very narrowly and remanded it back to the five folks, the Washington State Supreme Court, to sort out the state law on that. Well, that Washington Culver case is putting up two very important issues. It is putting up old, dead treaty rights, sprung alive in the last few years. It's putting tribal treaty rights up against Washington State sovereign authority. And the, the entities suing the state on the cover case are of the mind that tribal treaty rights are superior to state sovereign authority. And now it goes back to the Washington State Supreme Court, which has already given me previous points, to fix it. So this state is in very serious trouble in terms of having a real live statehood, a real live state sovereign authority with the huge expansion of what's going on with your 31 tribes and all the money that are influencing Olympia and counties and county commissions and local towns. Um, one more point that Bruce and I were talking about earlier, the Swinomish are part of the Cornelia Treaty and they want to reclaim Marsh Point and stuff. The Point Elliott Treaty of 1855, first all of the Stevens Treaties are truly dead. They died in 1934, at least and some of them sooner, and all the provisions required of the treaties were long ago paid. So the treaties are really dead, but the Point Elliott Treaty in and of itself included four or five, I can't remember how many tribes, but the Point Elliott Treaty created no reservations. The Point Elliott Treaty called for providing land to individual Indians. And that's probably pretty much the way it stayed from 1855 until 1934 when the Indian Gaming, I mean the Indian Reorganization Act, and all of a sudden these tribes are federally recognized tribal governments, well of course they need land. Oh well the Point Elliott Treaty said we can't. No it doesn't. But they have reservations here that are not lawful under the treaty. They're just uh, gifts from the state of Washington and the federal government. And uh, it's, a, it's a, the Sonomish are on very thin ice. I hope everyone here uh, fights hard to make sure they do not acquire those refineries in the March Point thing because they're the law. The law is always on our side. It's the politics, the money, and the political correctness and the fear of name calling that's winning. The law is on our side every single time. But it's very hard to find lawyers in Washington State that will take up cases because they get much bigger bucks from tribal clients. Um, or they don't want to be ostracized from their lawyer colleagues. That's a horrible process we deal with in 
Montana. We have to go out of the state to find an attorney in Montana that will defend a private property citizen in county or city. Um, so anyway, I could babble on. The, the one thing that you can do, and the reason I'm so proud of this particular group, you really are, thanks to Bill and many of you, you really are the very first political group, Republican group, to even be willing to listen, to invite someone like me to say, you know what's going on? You're the first among all Republicans and Democrats across the country. You're the first. And I'm hoping that your Republican Party organization will share this information with your colleagues in other counties because it's time for the political parties, it's time for the elected officials to look at these things. You know, we're all American citizens. I'm, I'm now working on a campaign. Um, I had this I had this thing in the middle of the night and I thought, you know, we really need to unhyphenate Americans. We need to knock it off about being African American, you know, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, Chinese Americans. There's 156 ethnic bosses to mark on the U.S. Census. And each one of those boxes, you know, distributes funding based on ethnicity or skin tone. You know, and now we have an administration that says we need to unify, we need to all come together, we need to be American citizens. So I, thought, I woke up one night thinking, you know, we need to unhyphenate Americans. And the way to do that is what if, what if the families anywhere in the United States, uh, what if their income level is at a low income level or poverty threshold level? What if the only criteria for re receiving some safety net funds from the federal or state government were based on annual household income alone. Just annual household income, that's really neutral. And the only criteria would be that the persons in the household, it wouldn't matter what their religion is, their sexual lifestyle is, their marital status, nothing. Their skin tone. What if those American citizens under that roof that were in a low income household, you know, could receive help? There's folks in Appalachia, folks in the South, that cannot qualify because their skin tone isn't the right color, you know? But what if it was just on annual household income, and not long term, but enough to help bring people up? And it no longer mattered what your ethnicity was. You know that tribal families across this country would live better, receive more under annual household income than they get from their freaking wealthy tribal governments? You know? And what would happen if tribal families had a decent living and could stand up a little better to their abusive tribal governments? So I really am hoping that that's a little far-fetched, but it's one of those common sense things. Just annual household income. We're all Americans. What more do you need to be if you need help than an American citizen? So that's one of my new pursuits, and it's sort of an indirect uh, approach to uh, 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 con confronting Indian policy. Anyway, I've probably babbled on enough, so I would like to, let's see if I forgot anything. I very seldom do notes, but Bill was stern with me. He wanted me to tell you everything I could. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that covers some of the big chunks. You know, remember the sovereign immunity. It's gone. Yeah. Let's have some questions. Uh, oh. so, so Glacier County, 2017, there was a class action lawsuit filed by four, 400. Could you give yeah. us an update, just a brief background and update, and it can that go to Supreme Court? Well, they filed in 2017. They, this, uh, they, they currently have a class action suit, a new one moving through. But the first one they filed went up to the Montana State Supreme Court. Uh, where about 400 cut bank residents uh, sued the state and the county for fiscal mismanagement of the federal county budget. The state of Montana, the lower state court and the Supreme Court, ruled 
that these citizen taxpayers did not have standing. Isn't that cute? These citizen taxpayers did not have standing. Doesn't that sound like the Western State Supreme Court? Yeah. I tell you, this political, tribal political influence goes all the way up through your federal and state court systems, up through your appellate courts, and it's not until you get to the U.S. Supreme Court Absolutely. that there's any help at all. That's right. You just have to plan on having a case, knowing the law's on your side, planning to lose, 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 till you get up to the Supreme Court and you win big. And that's been, that's been working, working very well lately. Um, they have a class action now, because in that first case, they hired a Montana attorney, good man, everybody loved him, great guy, and all, and all of his pleadings, he never once mentioned the existence of the Blackfeet Reservation, he never once mentioned the fact that the three Glacier County commissioners were Blackfeet tribal members. No reference whatsoever in his arguments. Just find state law and violations of financial regulations, and they just lost big. Now they have a class action going through federal court where they are mentioning these things. And so that's, we're, we're watching how that rolls out. But so far, the, you know, the time it takes to get through the federal courts that is not on their side. They'll be in deep financial trouble all along while they're waiting. Yeah, Bruce. What kind of irritates me a little bit is the fact that we pay their state funds and federal funds supporting the Indian tribes, and they hire many attorneys to fight us. Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm currently still engaged. I retired from Hobart, but I'm still under contract as an advisor, consultant. And the Oneida tribe has sued Hobart, well, 11 times while I was there in eight years. And they're still suing. We have a huge case going now that I'm advisory to. And uh, they're claiming Indian country. They're claiming all the whole municipality, even though it's, there's only 1,500 acres in federal trust land out of 33 square miles. But there's all oh, it's all Indian country. So we have a huge suit. And you're right. We have that Hobart has one municipal attorney. They have seven, you know, federal big guns coming after our one municipal attorney. You know, but I had, I had a couple. Tina yeah. and I had a couple talk to a couple of attorneys. Yeah. And I said the only way we'll make progress against the tribes in the state is if we go to the United States Supreme Court. That's and, right. he, and Richard Fox was. Uh, the water rights issue that they had and they went to court and so forth. That's what the attorney said. Don't go, don't bother going to Washington State Supreme Court. That's not going to help you a bit. Oh, you no. have to go to the Supreme Court. No. And I don't mean to be harsh, so harsh about the Washington State Supreme Court or the Montana State Supreme Court, but money and politics talks on these judicial benches. And uh, it's, it's really quite frightening. We have, you know, we're hearing all about, we're watching old Mueller and the deep state and all that baloney going on in D.C. Washington State has its own deep state. Montana, Montana thrives and brags about its corruption. It, it had the Copper Kings, the Anaconda Copper Mines and the Copper Kings and came into its statehood. And what you could get away with, that's who they are. You know what I mean? And, and to a certain extent, it's still that way. Is the corruption is uh, respected, and it's a deep state of its own, Montana. It really is. I, I should. Now the people are just the best. I love the, the good folks there, and they're hardworking. In fact, they're so hardworking. They're out in the fields at sunup. We're working with the cattle. They're home in the late evening, and they don't have time to watch the news, read the paper, make appointments with their elected officials. They're just earning a living. And they're being so badly abused by their state and the tribal governments there, just the way you are here. But some of you, you know, can take time to meet with the elected officials and write a letter and, and read. And those of you who can, must. We've been quiet here for 30 years. And there's no reversing it unless a great voice rises up. And a, a, a conservative constitutional property rights voice that um, changes the chairs in Olympia and in the counties. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, my, oh, I'm sorry. 
We have a question. You had one earlier. Go ahead. Oh. Elaine, would you mention just briefly for the group how the state is, has been excluded from the gaming compacts? Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Bruce. You, I mentioned that you've had five Democrat governors and that um, Lowry really got the ball rolling and the other governors, subsequent governors, have uh, exacerbated it. But the real Indian princess, Christine Gregoire, mm -hmm. did two things. Um, I think she received a contribution, did you say, of like $650,000 for her campaign. And in exchange for that, where the gaming compacts that had been the Indian Gaming Act requires a compact between the gaming tribe and the state, and in that compact, a portion, a small portion of the annual gaming revenue goes to the state to offset the expenses of infrastructure and services provided to the casinos and whatnot. That's the gaming compact. Every tribe that opened up a casino, the state would say, hey, cool, we're going to get some more money flowing in every year from that casino. Then Great Work comes along and stops it. Gregor says the tribal governments here, the casinos here, no longer have to annually contribute a portion of their gaming revenues to the state of Washington. So that's gone. Now that's multi-millions every year, gone. Then she says each tribe in Washington state may uh, have up to five casinos. Now think about that. There's only five or six urban areas in Washington State, Olympia, Seattle, up here, Bellingham, Yakima, Tri-Cities, Spokane, five or six urban areas. We have 31 tribes that can each have in the long term up to five casinos. They will plunk those down along your best exit along I-90 or I-5, that's already happening up and down I-5. And uh, when, when a casino plunks in to a community, the very first thing that happens is that um, the disposable income from that community goes into the slot machines. And as that revenue jacks up, then they have a hotel, and then they have some other tax exempt businesses, and pretty soon they have economically cannibalized the host community. That's happened to Marysville. That is progressively happening all around your casinos and their complexes. You know, and that's only happening because your state elected officials are letting it. There's other reason. One other yeah. reason. Yes. People go in there. People go in there. That's right. I refuse to go in yeah. and give yeah. my dollars to somebody to take yeah. away my property rights. Yeah. I just will not darken their door. Very good. Can you explain something to me? Well, 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 well let me just give Mike a chance here, and then you're next. But that's why I wanted him to ask the question because we had this oh. discussion before. So. Oh. Out of the 28 states in the country that have casinos within those states with agreements with the reservations, out of the 28, 27 have agreements. There's only one that yeah. doesn't, which is our state. Yeah. So, yeah. Here's my question. So now that you talk about the culverts and mm -hmm. how this, the, the Supreme Court decision returned out the state of Washington, mm -hmm. now, if you want to approach this whole culvert idea, how about instituting legislation where user fees for the casinos to fund culvert? Uh, makes sense to me. <laughs> Let's get you an officer. <laughs> get you an officer. You the sell Indians, that. The Indians are the ones yeah. leading the charge. The oh, yeah. tribes are the ones that want them. Yeah. And the, so the Supreme Court says you have to fund them well. Yeah. Well, they're taking. So it seems to me that makes perfectly. Yeah, and, and that usually there's an irony to that, Mike, because the Swinomish uh, it, 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 are taking the user fee, the, the, you know, where the state of Washington isn't taking the property tax from the right. Shelter Bay folks anymore. It's a user, it's a use fee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just yeah, that user fee should be able to work both ways. Exactly. Yeah. Really should. Good point. Hmm. Yes. Can you explain to me why uh, the tribes, so let's say uh, the Swinomish tribe has how many people? Pardon? How many people are in How much? How many people in Swinomish? 500. 500 people? Yeah. And they make millions and millions, you say? <coughs> Why do they still come to, Tino worked for DSHS for 23 years. Why did they end up coming to the state 
welfare system to get benefits and medical help and so forth if the tribes, their beneficiary, is not, what, what's happening? They're not getting help? Why? That's happening big time where I live on the Flathead Indian Reservation and I think elsewhere. Tribal governments receive annual federal subsidies for health services and child and education services. And then when the tribal member goes in to get health services, they're redirected to the state resources. And the health services money is redirected elsewhere. There's no auditing. There's no auditing of the multi-billions of dollars that go out for the various programs targeted for housing or targeted for education or targeted for health. You know, they just go, they just send the money out there and the tribal governments don't even say thank you very much. They usually just say more. Yeah. Um, and then the tribal families come in for services or are waiting for a home. And they're on a waiting list for 15 years uh, because there's just no money. But the money goes in every year. It just disappears. Yeah, I mean, it's such a horrible hoax. And the most, the people that are suffering the most are the tribal families themselves. Absolutely the tribal. And they cannot speak up. The retaliation is not fun if they disagree with the tribal government decision. They can, they can be kicked out, right? Well, uh, they, they can. Yes, they can be just enrolled. But usually it's just a living, another form of living hell they give them. But, go ahead. Uh, tribal control of game management, like for me personally, it kind of relates to elk, but tribal, the, the management or lack of management, uh -huh. you can get something to say about that? You talking about uh, wildlife and gaming? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, that's a problem over on the Yakima, as you and I were talking about. The again, it's uh, the access and control that tribal governments have <laughs> over fishing or hunting or any of these things are really decisions made first by a state or a federal government, and uh, and they have been very generous. Allow, and they, with their political correctness, uh, they have bought into, we were here first, you stole our land. They have bought into one of the most stupid words out there that's getting buzzed around everywhere. It's our aboriginal land. You know, it's our aboriginal land. You know, and that plays into decisions that allow tribes to have inordinate control over a certain gaming, uh, certain elk, deer, you know, fish, whatnot. Here's, here's the insanity of this. I'm just going to, I'm getting kind of perhaps overly candid, but ask me if I care, you know? <laughs> um, I want you to say the, Tell the, me the truth. Yeah. The insanity is, think about this from a common sense perspective. Who determined that one specific ethnicity of human beings owns the salmon? Mm. or any fish, or any species. One specific ethnicity, they're ours. They're ours. And you have a federal government and a state government that says, oh, okay. And it just takes off. It's just insane. This whole Indian policy thing since 1924, when every American Indian is a full citizen of the United States, there should be no reservations since 1924. Amen. There should be no... Uh, there should be no federal Indian policy since Take 1924. The high Take the high for now. That's what we need to do. Yeah. We need to, and we need to do that to improve the quality of life of tribal families. Let me tell you, one more. I'm working with ten families of, of tribal families on the flathead, and I'm working. We're going to see Monday uh, one of the worst horror stories. Laura Lee and I have been uh, supporting this family. There is the Indian Child Welfare Act. Now, this is another total joke that Congress did, but they suckered in. And you know, the tribes have thousands of lobbyists that patrol the halls of Congress, and they go in, they say, my people, my people, they're adopting our children out to other ethnicities, and we're losing our culture, my people, my people. So the Congress gives them the Indian Child Welfare Act, which in, it, in its regulations is reasonably fair. Um, but What's happening with the under the Indian Child Welfare Act is the, the Welfare Act give, gives the tribal government 
100% full parental rights over every enrollable child under 18. So if you're an enrolled tribal family and you have children under the age of 18, you're not really the parent the tribal government is. And you better behave yourself or you're going to knock on the door from the Child Protective Services saying you're not a bad parent. Now I'm working with 10 families on the Flathead alone, and there's many others who have dared to disagree with their tribe and got that knock on the door. One family has three girls missing for three years. They don't even know where they are, you know, because their father stood up at a hearing and said, don't let this tribe take her dam. Don't, the federal government, don't give this tribe a major dam in the Columbia River system. And uh, he got, they got the knock on the door. Now normally, if a child is removed from an abusive family, that's a good thing, and the Indian Child Welfare Act provides for that. But it also provides for family reunification, and, you know, it has some good things in it. But it has been weaponized by so many tribes to keep the families in line. And, uh, and it's also a subterfuge for a problem that they're starting to talk about out loud because it's getting so severe, severe, and that's child trafficking. These families who've lost their children should be able to visit with their children once a month. These families should be getting family reunification services to, you know, for whatever reasons. <clears throat> they're just gone. And so that Indian Child Welfare Act that strips the parental rights of your enrolled tribal families and gives them to a, an abusive tribal government is not a fun thing. Uh, I'll just give you one more story, the one that uh, Laura Lee and I are, in fact we have a video, don't we Laura? They, yeah. Um, there's a wonderful fellow, he was a former chief of police for the whole tribe over up here in Northwest Washington. Wonderful chief of police. And, he married, they had two little kids, a little boy four, a little uh, brand, new brand new baby, two, three month old baby. His wife acquired a severe addiction. So he took his wife, who was an enrolled Quileute, to her tribal rehab services for help. The day he took his wife in for help, they took the little baby girl and they took the four-year-old boy. For whatever reason, they had no reason to do that, but they did. Yeah. Yeah. That father has for, it took him eight years to get his son back, being bullied through in, in, in the kangaroo tribal court. His boy was 12 years old before he could get him back. He does not have his little girl back. The tribal chairman liked her. And the tribal chairman runs the council, runs the tribal court, runs the school district there. And the tribal chairman is violating all law every day, and nobody cares. And this man is still anguishing to have his little girl back, now 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we have exposed that story and filmed him. He's a wonderful, um, and he's, he's broken hearted, but, he, but he's still proud of his culture. And, you know what I mean? Uh, he, he just got an issue with a very corrupt and abusive tribal government. And uh, that's just one time. We've got horror stories all over the country. That's where I speak up for tribal families. They can call me racist all day long. But I get contacted by people that can't speak for themselves. And wherever I can help, I do, as, as do several other organizations that I work with. We can speak for them. If they're willing to contact me and tell me what the issues are, we can preserve the anonymity. And I'm working with two or three national attorneys that are now helping helping the one uh, fellow and about to help the 10 families. We, we can put them in touch with some very good legal counsel that's starting to help them out a little bit. But they live in fear of their tribal governments and set of respect. And you know, I guess I'm saying things I... I haven't ordinarily said, but I respect every culture, and the most, the ones I respect the most, are the ones that res preserve their culture, pass it down to the families, because it's the right thing to do. You know what I mean? The Irish, <laughs> the, the the Hispanic, 
You know, the black Americans, there's a black, there's, we have cultures that are wonderful. And the reason they're wonderful and alive and well is because everybody takes care of remembering and respecting where they came from and their culture and their family traditions. You know? Then we have what used to be the wonderful American Indian. Beautiful culture, beautiful culture, Surviving survivors, two survivors. We did a lot of things wrong with them, just like we did a lot of things wrong with black. But they preserved their culture. Now, they have to be paid to. Now, if you take their tribal government away, by God, they'll lose their culture. Not the ones that believe in their ancestry. Not the ones that believe in their family traditions. They will preserve their culture just as much as any of them. My son, my son lives with me, and his best friend is a tribal fellow. And we were sitting the other day because my son broke his foot. He hit a deer off a motorcycle and <laughs> got thrown out. So I'm sitting having a visit with my son and his tribal friend, and I'm listening to this fellow. He and his wife live at the bottom of a mountain. They've got some land, and they have a couple of kids, and they eat only wild game, and he teaches his children to shoot and hunt and gather food, and, he, and, and he's a 2018 kind of guy, but it's culture and ancestry, and he makes his own jerky naturally, the traditional way. And I said, would you be, I won't say his name, but I said, would you be okay? I said, you're doing exactly what your ancestors have always done. You're doing it right now in 2018. Would you continue doing it if the tri your tribal government went away? And he said, well, of course. I said, of course. It's our family. It's our culture. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and that impresses me. These families and cultures that believe in themselves and believe in their ancestry, and incidentally, I forgot to mention, I have said in many talks that I am Cherokee and French, and my husband is a descendant of Sacagawea, and then it occurred to me last fall that, gosh, you know, I've said that because I, I have my grandmother and mother's enrollment number of the Cherokee tribe, but I've said that a lot, and I wonder if it's true. I've said I'm French, and maybe I better check it out. So, I sent my DNA off to Ancestry.com, crossing my fingers, you know what I mean? And, and it came back, I am zero French, you know? You're Norwegian. <laughs> no, but my largest percentage of, of genetics is 30% Native American, Southeastern United States. So I'm 30% Cherokee. And I'm 24% Irish, for goodness sakes. I'm, not, I'm an Irish Indian. It's, I should also say I'm 41 years sober. It's no damn wonder I drank. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 So that was quite, quite affirming to, you know, to, uh, to learn that. But they'll still call me anti-Indian. And I work with tribal families everywhere I go and answer every call I can. Uh, but they'll still call me racist, and I don't care. I mean, that's that, you call me a name, that's just a fool without an argument. <laughs> and, I, and that really is. Yeah. You know, you gotta call me any slur, any slur, and you're a fool without an argument. You have no civil respect for anybody. So I just shine them on. I'm on the Southern Poverty Law Center hate list. <laughs> right up there with, that is, it's a badge of honor. I'm right up there with Ben Carson and Laura Ingram and all the fun folks. You know what I mean? <laughs> because this, you know, we're, we're starting to be able to reverse this. It, the, the name calling is losing its power. But we need to help it. So if anybody calls you a name, to say you're a fool without an argument, thank you for sharing, you know, and, and push back. We have to push back. So, any other questions? Oh, I, yeah, I can't see. Yes. George. Instead of suing the tribe, being uh -huh. the plaintiff, explain the advantage of provoking them into suing you so oh. you can be the defendant. Very good. What's that? Question. George asked me to say instead of the suing the tribe, that a better strategy is to provoke the tribe so they sue you. Uh, and that's kind of what has worked in Hobart very effectively because the tribe is constantly suing Hobart because Hobart says no, you know. And they say, when a tribal government sues in state or federal court, it comes into court, they give up their sovereign immunity. 
and they're open to full discovery and disclosure and everything. Uh -huh. So you sue the tribe, tribal government, and they can get the case dismissed right now on their sovereign immunity. So it's really better to stand up and revoke and say no because number one, the law is on your side. Almost 100% of the time, the law will be on your side. And when they sue you because you're not giving them what they want, they lose their sovereign immunity and you got them. And you can drag them through the courts. And that's what obert has been doing effectively. And several other uh, communities across the country are doing the same. Well, so, he knows that, correct? Yes, I, I believe he does, you know. I'm pretty sure he does because I've met Will on a couple of occasions and same thing with Ron Weiss and I've had some really good conversations with with uh, the Skagit County folks. You know, you are unique here. You are really unique here. And the you who are in this group, I, I know that there's a whole bunch of other events going on around here this weekend. So the fact that there's this kind of a turnout is high praise for Bill and all of you because this is so important that this group needs to grow its voice and its noise and its voting everywhere you can. No, okay, I can't. Oh. Pardon your answer. Yeah. My, my wife and I live in Shelter Bay. Yes. We're one of the 30 some uh, lots that are fee simple. Mm. And uh, everybody else in Shelter Bay. I have been very willing to meet with Shelter Bay folks for a number of years, particularly when the state of Washington came and said, oh, okay, they don't, do the, they don't pay their taxes in the state anymore. I've been e eager to go talk to the Shelter but I understand that there's kind of a mixed uh, voice there, and that there are those that are afraid that if, they, if I come and talk to them, I'll rock the boat. So I've not been able to I have not been able to go talk to those Shelter Bay people, but if you have friends and family in there, rock their boat. Because they, they should have a voice. They should not be doing taxation without representation. I mean, that's what that is. And you, you can call it a use fee, and that's baloney. It's a tax, and it's going to a tribe where they may not go to the meetings or vote. It's taxation without representation, and your lovely state, let them do it. It's just disgusting. Yeah. If we have, uh, if the, there's only one sovereign, southern, sovereign government in the United States, in yeah. the United States Constitution, yeah. how can the uh, tribes consider themselves a sovereign nation? Yeah, that, boy, you got to come everywhere I go, Bruce. <laughs> there's, just a little reminder, there's three sovereigns, and they are identified in order in our U.S. Constitution. And the first one is, we the people, it's you and me, my individual sovereignty. And the second one is, the states, the state sovereignty. And the third one is, the states created the federal sovereignty. And those sovereignties are in order. The founders put those in order. We the people, we govern from the bottom up. And we govern through a representation of our states, and then our states, created the federal government, and you know, they have this balance of federalism that's so out of, out of whack right now these days, but again, the Supreme Court is starting to rein it in. There is no wording, there's not a single word in the U.S. Constitution that contemplates tribalism as a governing system in the United States. There's just none. They use the um, Indian Commerce Clause, that's about goods and services, but they expanded that out to whatever. But Indians, they say Indians not taxed, and they use, and that was, that was for census counting only. But they use that to say, well, they're separate and they're special, and we owe them because we stole their land, and, and uh, they were here first. Um, so there is nothing constitutional about any of this federal Indian policy. Absolutely nothing. But look at the power that that's had across our country. And, and because, I want to go back to, let me go back to the pilgrims. The tribes say, oh, we were here first, you stole our land. Do you, in your memory and history of the pilgrims, did you see them coming weaponized with full body armor? And, you know what I mean? 
the pilgrims, the first settlers on this land, were not coming to harm anybody. They were escaping religious tyranny and that was so severe they were willing to take a trip across the unknown and try to survive here. And it didn't all go well with the friendly Indians and some of the not so friendly Indians. It took 40 years to establish Jamestown. Just to establish. Now, those same pilgrims were all ancestors of our descendants across the country. And we have been raised in the American culture to be kind, be nice, share, help the needy. We have a really good heart. The American people have a really good heart. And I don't know of any more anybody that has been more effectively successful with just abusing that heart than the elected officials, you know, the tribal government leaders who know they'll give it to us. They'll give it to us. You know? And there's not a enough there's no Indian word for enough. It's like, okay, hold on. You've been giving us uh, bazillions every year. We can take it from here. We got our casino. No, there's nothing. Never enough. There's no word for thank you. Thank you for anything they've received. It's more. We got that. We want more. We got that. We want more. It's incrementalism, financial and political incrementalism that is creeping across, and that's why the book is called going to pieces, the dismantling of the United States. Because we're going to be a country of collectivism with these folks who tied in with the liberals and the socialists. We're going to be a country of collectivism and not a republic form of, and, and property rights will be history.